Hammer is the aggro deck of modern. The basic premise of the deck is using the namesake Colossus Hammer in conjunction with free equip effects to provide your creatures with an enormous power boost at a low mana cost. Once attached, you can end the game in just a couple of hits. Stoneforge Mystic and Urza Saga provide consistency to the deck, finding your Colossus Hammers. They can also find Shadow Spear, making sure that your Hammer wielders don't just get champ blocked, raised or otherwise outclassed. Esper Sentinel, Giver of Runes and Protection Tricks make it harder for opponents to interact profitably while you look for spots to attach your hammers. The Edge of Salvation and Blacksmith skill are mostly equal, with skill performing better in combat and against sweepers, while Surge covers Force of Vigor and Fury better. Pure Steel Paladin asks you to reliably achieve Metalcraft. Luckily, Ulza Saga asks for a density of cheap artifacts too. Zero Drop, Artifact Creatures and Springleaf Drum are a way to ramp a little bit in the early game and fulfill that requirement. Ulza Saga also serves serves as a strong backup plan, making big constructs for cheap can be enough to win games where your equipment synergies don't come together. When choosing which zero drop to play, Mem Knight is much stronger at blocking Ragavan and dealing damage in scrappy games, while Ornithopter is preferable against decks with Ren 6, Fury or many blockers to fly over. I play 6 one drops currently, which is higher than most deck lists, but I value explosive springleaf drum opening hands in game 1. Kaldra Complete is another backup plan. Stoneforge Mystic will search for Kaldra and put it into play unless opponent interacts with the Mystic. Kaldra alone can win the game against many decks, so look for spots where your Mystic is unlikely to die or you can protect her. The most common builds of Hammer are Mono White and Blue White. Mono White has the best mana base against Blood Moon. Even as a monocolor deck with at most a light splash, often enough you will have to face uh, Blood Moon. Some opponents are going to use it as a way to fight your utility lands. Blue White is the more popular way to build Hammer nowadays, mainly splashing for Spell Pierce. Spell Pierce is a tool that shines the best against combo decks like Creativity or Cascade. Annoyingly, Blue White is the only white color pair missing a canopy land, so splashing blue comes at a greater cost compared to any other color. Since I find canopies to be very valuable in Hammer, I am slightly hesitant to splash blue for Spell Pierce. If a blue white canopy land ever releases, I will probably default to the blue splash too. Springleaf Drum and a Zero Drop can let you play a turn 1 Urza Saga and make a construct on turn 2. If that's what you want to do, but your Zero Drop is your only creature, it might be wise to hold your Zero in hand until turn 2, not to expose yourself to creature removal. Pure Seal Paladin's draw a card trigger can be detrimental. If all you care about is equipping, playing your hammers first won't leave your opponent with a window to remove Paladin. Make sure you have Metalcraft as soon as Paladin enters play if possible. Then, after you regain priority with Paladin in play, the first thing you want to do is to activate the equip ability, preferably targeting a different creature. If you try to equip an already equipped hammer, but the new target gets removed, hammer will simply stay equipped to the original creature. Thanks to that, you can later move your equipment around to your liking, but attaching it to a different creature first will let you play around a single removal spell better. If you want to move your equipment post-combat, take note of whether your creatures took damage. If your Memnite was champ blocked, moving a hammer from it will kill it. An important trick to remember is that despite Colossus Hammer taking away flying from the equipped creature, reactivating Ink Moth once again after Hammer is already attached to it will once again turn it into a flying creature. It's unintuitive, but because equipped creature loses flying and Ink Moth Nexus becomes a creature with flying effects apply in the same layer, the one with the freshest timestamp takes precedence and Ink Moth ends up flying in this scenario. Sigarda Zaid and Pure Steel Paladin asks you to do slightly different things with your hammers. Aid wants them in hand, while Paladin wants them in play. You need to evaluate every situation individually, but in general, keeping a hammer in your hand will leave you with more options and top decks available as the game progresses. It's also beneficial to play hammer after Paladin against an opponent with no removal in order to draw cards, so you'll typically play out your hammers early only if you have early Pierce Paladin in your hand and are constrained on mana. Sigarda Zaid gives your equipment flash, so you can attack with multiple creatures and equip the unblocked one. If you control multiple Sigarda Zaid, your equipments are going to trigger once for every aid in play. That's useful because separate aid triggers can target different creatures, which lets you play better around burn spells. 
If you control Sigarda Zaid and put Kaldra into play, you might want to attach Kaldra to one of your creatures. To do that, remember to stack your abilities properly. Living Weapon is not a May ability, so it needs to resolve before Sigarda Zaid ability. Otherwise, Kaldra will end up reattached to the newly created germ token. When using Urza's Saga against engine with explosives set to zero, if your Saga reaches its third chapter, it might be correct to pass priority without tapping it at all. If your opponent passes back, you get to fetch Piffing Needle, name explosives and save your current construct. If your opponent uses explosives, you get to make another construct and search for something else. Before we go over sideboarding in specific matchups, let me mention that I think Hammer is a relatively inflexible deck. Your core plan will remain the same. As a result, Hammer simply cannot sideboard too many cards profitably. That fact makes me value higher impact cards over their more flexible counterparts. March of Otherworldly Light, Sanctifier Onvek, Run of Magistrate and Orvar are all tools with very precise jobs which they are very good at. The Hammer Mirror is a race. There is little interaction, so killing your opponent faster or making a larger Shadow Spear wielding construct will almost always win. Kaldra Complete is a very important card. Thanks to First Strike and its damage exiling ability, the only way to profitably block or attack through it is with your own Kaldra or Flyers. You need a very good reason not to search for Kaldra Complete with your first Stoneforge Mystic. Giver of Runes is a way to prolong the game. As long as your opponent doesn't have access to Trample or Flying, Giver can let you block in the Definitely. Giver can also let you block Kaldra equipped creatures and soak the damage. Proactively, it's much harder to use. You'd frequently need to give your attacker protection from colorless to get past constructs, but protection from colorless would make your equipments fall off. Ink Moth Nexus is a very common way for games to end. Sometimes, Games will stall out with both players hitting each other with giant creatures with Shadow Spear, putting both players at a very high life total. Ink Moth can ignore both the life gain and ground blockers and finish such a game. March of Otherworldly Light, Path to Exile, or any other removal spell you might run will serve you well, making it much easier to influence races in post-board games. I particularly like March, as it answers Urza's saga cheaply and creates big tempo swings early in the game while being a great and very flexible top deck. Exiling the Shadow Spear specifically can change the entire texture of the matchup in your favor. Protection spells are poor even post-board. There are only a few removal spells and they are hard to line up, especially considering Esper Sentinel stacks making it hard to keep up instants. If you splash blue, Spell Pierce is slightly better, but I wouldn't be excited about it and I would still look to cut it. Some players swear by sideboarding Piffing Needle. It can come in handy as a saga target and can let you cement your advantage on certain board states. On the other hand, it's often a bad draw and there is a risk involved in needling cards in your own deck. Ragdos Scam. During early turns, try to keep the possibility of a double fury in mind. If double grief hasn't happened turn 1, it mostly means your hand is safe from it, so you can keep some extra creatures in your hand for later. Sanctifier on Vec shines here, having protection from essentially your opponent's deck. Ragdos can only kill Sanctifier with engineered explosives or sometimes Path of Peril. Surge of Salvation is also an excellent tool, stopping an entirety of a fury or just plainly countering removal spells. Notably, with Sanctifier's in postboard games, the value of supplementary equipments increases. Having access to Sword of Fire and Ice, Nettle Cyst, or even a Cranial Plating to equip your protection creature can be a very effective plan in some lower resource games. Hedetsugu Consumes All is a scary card to keep in mind, although you'll rarely be able to play around it very well. Spell Pierce would help slightly, although Pierce isn't great in general against a Blood Moon discard spell deck. Ornithopter is slightly better against Fury than Memnite, but I think the threat of Ragavan is more important, so I stick to Memnites. Merktite. Blue Red Merktite is a good matchup, at least game 1. Low Curve and Urza's Saga plays well around Counterspell, and Esper Sentinel can be a huge pain for their cantrips. On top of that, their removal is damage based, so hammer equipped creatures are virtually unkillable. Avoid letting them spend their mana efficiently. As long as they don't pressure you with flyers, there is no rush, so frequently it will be beneficial to pass and wait for them to tap out or tap low before you attempt to equip. Rare game 1 cards that can stop your equipped creatures to keep in mind are Brazen Borrower, Akmage's Charm and their one copy of Otawara. Post board, Merktide gets to cut down on non-spectacular cards like Ragavan or counter spells in favor of powerful tools like Engineered Explosives, Dressdown, Upgrade or Brotherhood's End, so it gets much harder. I'm typically sideboarding Sanctifier on Vex over some Zero Drops and Drums in order to make my deck slightly bit stronger against their much better post board interaction. Piffing Needle comes to answer Explosives. As previously mentioned, I like having access to one independently strong equipment to pair with my Sanctifiers. 
I tend not to sideboard removal spells in the matchup. A path to exile can swing the game, but available removal matches up mediocrely against Merktide's threats, and I'm not interested in playing this type of a game against them. Currently, I'm cutting Kaldra. Had I had no access to an alternative midrange equipment, I would look to keep Kaldra in my deck. Creativity is a much clunkier deck than Hammer, and that's the angle I'm looking to take advantage of in the matchup. Orvar is my favorite cyber card here, as he complements the go fast, no seat belts approach. Holding up mana for tricks like Pierce or Hallowed Moonlight can easily backfire, as if you don't pressure creativity enough, they might easily fall to take the control of the game and reach the late game where they are going to be clearly favored. Orvar lets you pressure them exactly how you want, while also keeping you safe from mid-game creativities. Don't be afraid to play an Esper Sentinel on turn 1 on the draw. Even if it dies to a Ren and 6 ping, you drew a card and Sentinel was not going to get better later. Remember that Blacksmith skill can be used to effectively counter indomitable creativity with X equals 1. If you cast skill on the targeted opponent, it will gain indestructible until the end of the turn. Creativity only looks for a creature per every actually destroyed target. In a similar way, Surge of Salvation grants you Hexproof, countering all of the Archon of Cruelty triggers and giving you one last turn to push for lethal. If your when sideboards Seras Emissaries as an alternative creativity target, Orvar becomes useless. You'll also probably want more removal to break up their creativities. It's not a very common plan nowadays, but you have to be aware that some players will do that. Rhinos. Core plan of equipping Hammers beats the core plan of Rhinos, especially when Shadow Spear gets involved. On the other hand, free interaction of Rhinos can pose a problem. You need to try to be cognizant of Fury and Force of Negation, but you have a good amount of counterplay here. Fire Eyes and Brazen Borrower are fairly inefficient, so they are much easier to beat and navigate through. Even without the blue splash, we have access to some strong cascade hate in the form of Dranif Magistrate. After sideboarding, Force of Vigor is a very scary card, which they will almost assure play four copies of. Surge of Salvation helps a lot against it, as unlike Blacksmith skill, it counters Force of Vigor in its entirety. Waiting on your saga can help you play around Force of Vigor, but sometimes the best course of action will be to hope they won't have it. Living End has less interaction than Rhinos, but their core plan goes over the top of Hammer. Without spell pierces, the matchup is plainly not good. If you think Living End will be popular, that's one of the best reasons to stick to the blue-white build. You need anti-cascade cards or graveyard hate to beat them. Thomas Crypt or Relic of Pogantus can be a nice Urza Saga target. I would advise against bringing Sanctifier on Vec. The slight graveyard hating effect is not worth it, as most cyclers in Living End are blue. Elemental decks come in many shapes and varieties. They are unfavorable matchups, because they are almost entirely composed of creature removal. My general advice is not to play scared and force them to have it frequently. Elementals will have a stronger late game and their solitudes and furies only get better as they amass more resources and get to cast them with their mana. Hushbringer and Lavinia can help against pitch elementals or leyline binding. They aren't very effective at their jobs though. Opponents are still left with lots of counterplay with their other removal spells or teferis or just assembling enough mana. That makes me unexcited about their value over replacement. If I were to play Lavinia in my deck for different reasons, I would still probably bring her in here. Value cards like the Fairy, Time Reveler, or Sword of Fire, a nice in your sideboard, could help a little bit. Piffing Needle can impede otherwise fatal Boseju Ren loops. Amulets, Primeval Titans are going to go over the top of you, so you need to be faster and fight through their boss edges. Since their draws can be just as fast as yours, and you cannot interact favorably, it's a little bit of a bad matchup for Hammer. Much of other Wally Light is my favorite cyber card in the matchup. Undercutting their amulets, or especially sagas, will slow the amulet deck down considerably, at which point you have a better shot at killing them through their interaction. It's a much stronger angle of interaction compared to Path to Exile, as once amulet builds their mana, it's trivial for them to fight through a few removal spells. Yogmoth is a tough matchup, with their slew of blockers and a combo finish. Yogmoth himself can also wreak a little havoc across your low toughness creatures. Postboard, the game access to the scary Fossil Vigor. You want to kill them fast. Kaldra Complete can be a great way to punch past the board while not exposing yourself. Let's go over a few examples of opening hands and mulligans. This hand is very strong and I keep against all decks, as you can equip Hammer on turn 2 with a protection spell. On 6, I would put back Ginger Brute. On 5, it's close between Surge and the Canyon. Keeping Canyon on the play and Surge on the draw might be reasonable. Second hand is a bit weaker, but still I keep. Urza Saga can eventually get us a Springleaf Drum to provide second wife for pure steel Paladin. On 6, I would put back the Ink Moth Nexus. On 5, I would also put back a Colossus Hammer. 
This hand offers little at 7. We can certainly do better at 6, so I mulligan. At 6, we can put back a planes and keep it, but if the matchup requires a fast hand, I would mulligan to 5. On 5, I would always keep this, putting back a drum and a planes. This hand has no redeeming qualities and it's an easy mulligan on both 7 and 6. On 5, I would reluctantly keep, because it's really hard to have a good focat hand. I would put back Ornithopter and Search or Shadow Spear, hoping to top deck an equipper quickly. Here, we have no equipper, which is what we are usually looking for, but we can use Springleaf Jam with Mem Knight to produce constructs on turns 2 and 3. On top of that, if we draw an equipper, the hand suddenly becomes really good. I would keep it on 7. On 6, I would put back Sunbake Canyon. On 5, Canyon and Hammer. With the information I provided, hopefully, you gained a greater understanding of the Hammer deck. It will take time and practice to get better at playing it and winning games. Hammer is a deck where I would say that gameplay decisions and experience are much more important than the specifics of your deck list and uh, how you decide to fill out your last few deck slots. So don't get discouraged. Remember to leave a comment give a like or subscribe to my channel, it helps a lot. I plan on building a growing series of guides for modern, pioneer and maybe some other formats. Let me know in the comments if there are other archetypes that you are specifically interested in and would like to see covered in such a way. And remember that I stream on Twitch daily. Stay hydrated.